You're listening to Tangents, a brand new podcast from Coin Center, the leading nonprofit focused on the policy issues facing cryptocurrencies. Today, I'm lucky to have a conversation with Matt Hill and Keegan McClellan, who are the co founders of Start Nine. Uh, Keegan and Matt, welcome to Tangents. Hey, Peter, thanks for having us. Thanks yeah, for having us. <laughs> Happy to be your guinea pig on the inaugural edition. <laughs> So uh, why don't you guys just briefly give me a little bit of background about yourselves, introduce yourselves. Um, so I'm Matt Hill, um, co-founder of Start9. Uh, prior to Start9, Keegan and I, as well as our other two partners, uh, Aiden McClelland and Aaron Greenspan, uh, were all working at uh, Salt Lending. Um, that's where we met. Uh, I was CTO over there. Um, before that, uh, I have experience building uh, a few different companies across a few different industries. Um, grew up as a bagel baker uh, in a family-run wholesale bagel bakery. So took That's that over nice. after college, eventually exited with a sale. Uh, got into plastics recycling with my brother, um, wholesale uh, industrial plastics uh, manufacturing. So actually taking in shredding, grinding, melting, and reselling you know plastics as a commodity all over the world. Um, I got out of that. He's still doing it. Uh, following that, I got into you know more of a technology angle. Uh, taught myself how to code. Uh, built an app called Work Blast, uh, which is a sort of do-it-yourself Uber application for businesses to kind of streamline the uh, their workforces and and make shift exchanges um, to facilitate shift exchanges. Um, you know that was fun. It was good. Uh, it's still in existence. It's still growing. Uh, the app has quite a few users now. Um, after that, you know, there's a few things interspersed between there, but after that, I was hired on as salt lending as the first, uh, developer and, um, ended up hiring Keegan. And then together we, uh, designed, architected salt systems and hired a 15 other engineers and, and built quite the technology stack over there before moving on to do what we're doing now. Yeah, I come from a, a much more, uh, sort of uh, you weren't a bagel baker <laughs> i was not a bagel baker that's, Ooh, that's really, like really much more canal to much more consistent background yeah a much <laughs> more sort of uniform funnel so to speak yeah I, I you know went to college for computer science graduated in 15 uh and then you know was during during the, my my college time i i was uh doing summer internships in u.s intelligence and my sort of focuses when I was in school was primarily computer security uh, and notably cryptography. And then, you know, a, a little bit of a brief stint in distributed systems my senior year, which kind of like primed me, so to speak, to really understand uh, Bitcoin when I ended up discovering it in, in 2015. So, uh, you know, it took more of a, I want to say background interest in it at that time or as a user. And you know, my day job was uh, working on cryptographic systems uh, for you know large businesses, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, I got tired of living in Maryland. Um, in the ah, Maryland. Area. I lived in Rockville actually, uh, but and so moved out to Colorado where I grew up, and you know, uh, ended up working uh, at Salt Lending in the 2017 crypto bubble. Okay. Oh, yeah, I mean, I so I, at the time I was work, working at Amazon, and I was like sitting, and I was supposed to be, you know, doing various projects there, and I just like kept getting distracted and fascinated by, you know, all of the the innovations in cryptography and distributed systems that were happening at the time, you know, and although most of them sort of never really materialized, uh, you know, it, it was interesting enough that I was paying attention to that, and I was like, I should just get a job doing this, and so so I did. Um, and then, you know, when we ended up leaving SALT, we decided, you know, that there was this real gap in the foundations of how people were supposed to run the software. Mainly the idea that, you know, when, when, you, when you tell someone about Bitcoin, you can like, you know, sell them on it and, and tell them all the benefits and they're like, all right, fine, fine, fine. How? Yeah. And a lot of people are like, you know, you go to Coinbase, but really Coinbase is just, you know, it's it's a bank it's a it's, it's online a standard, banking. Yeah. yeah it's it's a standard interface and it doesn't really give the this new technology the opportunity to shine that it ought yeah. and so 
but it made it user say, friendly, right? Because like you said, yes. running an actual Bitcoin client in 2017 or even now is not easy. Well, and I have to give Coinbase credit where it's due, right? Because they did create a, an extremely user friendly uh, application, but it very much mimics the existing infrastructure for finance. And the, with the, one of the necessary drawbacks of that is that it is not going to give the fundamentally new, interesting, and different uh, aspects of Bitcoin its time to really uh, be front and center. And so when we started Start9, we were trying to figure out you know, what needs there were and how we could get people to use the technology in a way that it was really designed for in a way that makes these aspects of you know censorship resistance and you know personal sovereignty uh give those their real day uh to shine oh that's perfect i was my next question was going to be like what's the one sentence pitch for start nine and it sounds like that's it in a nutshell but um maybe maybe repeat it for folks who who haven't caught on yet <laughs> sure so you know start nine we are attempting to build a platform for the distributed web. Now that phrase might not mean, you know, the same to every one of your listeners as it means to us, but so let me elaborate a little bit. Um, there is a rich ecosystem of self-hosted open source, sort of quote unquote sovereign uh, applications, software technologies in existence that traditionally are very difficult to access, run, manage uh, in, in, a, in a safe and uh, effective manner. Uh, it requires uh, time, expertise, uh, you know, and honestly, uh, not something most people have. Uh, even so, highly technical people are not going to go through the process. Anyway, so what are these decentralized or distributed applications? Because I think a lot of people start thinking of Bitcoin when they hear that phrase, but I get the sense you guys are talking about a broader class of applications that might even predate Bitcoin. Yeah, um, so email would be a, a very easy example, um, which predates a lot of the modern internet, uh, which is why email is actually so difficult to do well <laughs> uh, in, with modern technologies, because it, it predates a lot of them. Um, but email is essentially a distributed application uh, protocol, right? So anyone who is running the appropriate software can send messages to one another. And in no way, shape, or form does that uh, software require or even imply a central uh, funnel or authority. Um, yet email is, for most people on this planet, an incredibly centralized experience. Right. Um, I send you an email. It's not me sending you an email. It's me telling Gmail to send you an email and then store it for me indefinitely. And lo and behold, they now have all the emails and are thoroughly examining them, uh, be it with bots or otherwise. But it's funny when we when we often are faced with having to explain Bitcoin to policymakers, for example, um, and then we want to show them something like Coinbase. We often use the metaphor that like Coinbase is like the Gmail for email yeah, um, sure. to the Bitcoin protocol. But the funny thing is a lot of people don't even realize that email is this peer-to-peer -peer protocol, the SMTP protocol, and yeah. they're yeah. accessing it through a centralized server. So the metaphor doesn't even necessarily land well as like an educational tool because we've still got so much learning to do as far as distributed systems and how to use them to maximize individual freedom because we've become so comfortable with these centralized choke well, points. That's why they came about in the first place, right. was comfort and convenience, right? So why did email become Gmail? Um, it's because it was hard to do. It was not easy to set up your own uh, SMTP server uh, from the command line and then manage the data over time. Like what happens if your computer you know, crashes or all your emails gone? Well, suddenly backups became necessary and you know, um, good, intelligent entrepreneurs stepped up and were like, all right, we're going to solve this for everybody. We're going to make it really, really easy. We are going to do it uh, at the expense of the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of the technology. We're going to sort of become a, uh, a central party and authority, but it'll be really easy, right? And, and I, don't, I don't blame that. I, no. I, I don't see that as a negative thing. Like, 
what email brought to the world, what the internet has brought to the world is glorious. The, you know, we're connected, we're more connected than ever before. Uh, information is, is available uh, unlike any other time in human history. And it's due to the uh, leaps of, of technology and services that were provided by these centralized entities. But really, we uh, want to have it both ways, right? We want to be correct. able to have that user independence and still have it be intuitive so that even somebody who's not particularly technical could set this stuff up, right? So yeah, the, 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 I, the idea is that security is one of those things. There's like a class of properties in the world that people don't really appreciate uh, when they are working correctly. Um, I often term this uh, as like negative space, but like uh, insurance products are one of these things, but uh, security no notably is one of them. And so at the time when we didn't really have history and bad things and uh, to draw upon from the past, it didn't, it wasn't obvious that, you know, taking half of the world's emails and putting them under the control of one corporation was going to be a, a huge problem, right? right? It's like, it was the difference between I'm going to use, be, I'm going to be able to use email in this configuration, or I'm not going to be able to use it. And I don't see why I shouldn't use it in this configuration. But you know, in 2020, or even probably as early as 2015, maybe 16, when it came to a, to a head, uh, that people realize like, hey, maybe having all this stuff in one place is not, especially not with my own ownership, is a problem. And now we have to then go figure out how do we replicate the experience that people have today, which is extremely easy. Like a decade of research has gone into, gone into making it as easy as it is. And then port it to an architecture such that people can retain ownership over the, the software that does their bidding as well as the data that that software produces. You said something interesting. You said that there's like a, you call it like a negative space? Or yeah. So uh, like I, I, it's, we shift technical paradigms to something that has obvious benefits, but because people are still thinking of it in the old way, they don't realize some of the risks. Right. Kind of the exactly. It, it's this idea that there are certain things that have value because of the alternative histories they prevent, right? So insurance, security, uh, even something more nitty gritty within the software world, but like test suites and type systems or stuff where you have, um, I mean, insurance is probably the one that most people are familiar with. It's like when everything goes right, you don't really see the value of insurance, mm -hmm. but it's when things go wrong that having it makes the difference between a really an okay and a terrible time. Yeah, I like that. Uh, one thing I've, I've tried to talk about more in the Bitcoin space is, look, people used to do all their transactions using cash and cash sort of just worked and we took for granted a lot of its qualities, right? The main yeah. quality of a cash transaction being that there's no record of it, it can be done without a middleman and it's just, it's final. it enables freedom and privacy. What's that? It's final. It's final, there's no settlement reversal, yeah. and. We had all those features and then we were like, well, but, but we can't do this remotely. We want to do this over the internet or over the phone. And so we switched to things like credit cards and banks and payment systems. And we think maybe that all of the risks are the same. We've just gained benefits, but we've actually lost some substantial benefits and gained some substantial risks in the form of now there is a middleman. Now it's not necessarily final. Now it's et cetera, et cetera. And and the dangers of that, the risks and dangers were not apparent. And And that's not... They, they didn't need to be apparent. It's not like they should have been. Yeah. We're in unprecedented kind of history here, right? The technology of the 20th century were, were plentiful, but focusing just on the, on the you know, latter portion of the 20th century and the, the advent of the internet um, was really a paradigm shift in human history. It created, whether we like it or not, a, a global um, society. Uh, where information was available from one part of the world to the other instantaneously. And we, we created that society rightfully, but it did come at the cost of this unforeseen, uh, you know, maybe some people saw it. Uh, there are certain, you know, books that were written in the, in the 90s, uh, the sovereign individual being one and others, uh, where they did rightfully kind of see this coming. But the momentum, the benefits were so overwhelming 
but the time has come to, to you know, shift the paradigm back, not lose any of the benefits that mm-hmm. we've gained, but to sort of patch the, the leaks under the, under the sink that we've been ignoring because they're starting to get uh, bigger. It's funny too, because, because I'm sure you guys think about those leaks rightly in terms of things like um, uh, fragility of systems and, and the lack of security, choke points, and those sorts of things for, for systems failing or being corrupted by, by malicious actors. From a legal standpoint, which we often think about at Coin Center, there's also a massive difference between having your data stored on a third party server and actually interacting with a person without a third party. And the, the main difference there is you have no Fourth Amendment privacy rights to anything that ends up on a third party server, which is nuts, which means all, everything that you do on that server can be yeah. uh, collected by law enforcement without a warrant. Um, and I, people don't realize that either because they still think of email as like, oh, yeah, email's that peer to peer one, even though I'm using Gmail, even though I'm handing Google all of my communications. And how often are people, you know, served with warrants for their emails? It's 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 not common. Oh, no, not at all. Yeah, Uh and and if you do run your own email server uh, and you run for president, it could actually turn out to be a big problem. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, Yeah. Uh, anyway, (laughs) um, so we probably now hit that point where everyone's like, okay, well, what the hell is Start9 then if it can solve some of these problems or at least take a a real good stab at them? So like uh, you've got a hardware product, which to me is always like that, cool unicorn in the crypto space, although sometimes I'm wary of them um, because so much of what we do is always digital. I love the fact that you've got like a bagel baking and plastics background, Matt, <laughs> because, it, you know, the physical the world matters, right? Meat space yeah. matters, even with the best Meat protocol. space matters. It's going to matter more in the future. What's interesting here is that the economy is shifting back because open source software is going to eat the world. Yep. So, so tell me about the, the embassy. Providing a service. So tell me about the the embassy, which is your first meat space product. Um, So the embassy itself, the physical device, uh, is about as boring as it gets. Good. By design. (laughs) Um, We are not innovating in hardware at the present time. Um, And that's because it's not necessary. The innovation is is at the convenience layer of the experience, not at the hardware layer. There's plenty Mm -hmm. of wonderful hardware already in existence. So we use the Raspberry Pi 4B. Um, with the four gigabyte, you know, the upper end of the, of the board that's offered. Um, and, and, and that's it. The, the basis of our hardware device is a Raspberry Pi. Uh, we have a, you know, a micro SD 128 gigabyte um, high endurance uh, card for persistent storage. And we have a little speaker that provides the user with audio feedback so that they know what's happening on the device because we didn't want a screen. Um, we didn't need no a screen. screen. There's, there's no keyboard. There's no, there's no interface here, right? This is, we have created something simple, easy to assemble, uh, robust, and, and, it, and it gets the job done. Um, and that's on purpose, again. And we've been criticized for this uh, because, oh, really? oh sure, well, not, not for choosing good, you know, commoditized hardware, but because people don't look deep enough to actually see what it is that uh, we're building and what the value proposition is. So we've, you know, advertised the embassy online on Twitter and, you know, responses have been like, they put a Raspberry Pi in a box and they're selling it at, <laughs> at a markup. You and too can like, have this, this box that doesn't seem to do selling. anything in your house. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. So tell me what the box does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's where the that's where the fun comes in. So we sell you this box. Now this box comes pre-installed with our own Ambassador operating system on it. Uh, Ambassador is a uh, distro, a Linux distro, particularly uh, Buster Raspbian Lite. So what we did was we took the most lightweight uh, Raspberry Pi compatible operating system and we stripped it down. We actually tore stuff off of it that is unnecessary. And then we started augmenting it. We started adding our own bespoke functionality to the OS um, such that it can accomplish its goal, uh, which in essence is the ability for a totally non-technical person to run open source distributed applications and protocols with the push of a button. Um, yeah. First so it's, off, it's, choice was it's your own personal server to do... X number of distributed applications, right? Like, so email yeah. it could be one. I don't think you guys have email yet, right? 
We don't have email. So email is tricky for a lot of reasons. And we can get to that later. Yeah, we'll get to that later. Uh, one of the, so, so with the advent of the internet, uh, we had a different category of applications. So like sort of prior to the internet, the primary way software ran was, you know, you'd have a desktop or, you know, maybe even uh, sort of to the late stage of this era, your, your laptop, and the software would run on that computer, right? But uh, one of the things that the internet opened up for us was communications technology that's 24 seven and fully remote. Um, but one of the problems with that, or one of the, the requirements, I should say, of running software like that is that you need computers to be always on, always listening, to be able to receive, send messages uh, on your behalf. And so, uh, and, and historically, administrating computers to do so was, you know, not super easy, but it also wasn't really required. And that's where a lot of the uh, major tech giants sort of emerged from, is that they stood up these services uh, on servers where their locations don't actually matter to you, and they just gave you a conduit to be able to access it. Um, the problem is, is that if you want to then go re-architect the internet in such a way that people are retaining ownership and control over that software, is that now instead of the tech giants running hundreds of thousands to millions of these things, uh, individuals need to be able to run them but no one really did the research to make it super easy for, no one really gave the iPhone experience to the personal server because we didn't need it at the, like for the last 10, 15 years, right? right? And you know what we realized in trying to actually set up our own lightning nodes is like how on earth is Bitcoin going to scale to many, many, uh, to, to sort of everybody using lightning if everyone has to go through the process of trying to stand up a live server uh, right. to be able to run this software and so so bitcoin and the lightning network just like email is you know designed originally to be this peer to peer experience where yes. your device is something you maintain it has good uptime it communicates and stays in touch with the rest of the peer to peer network to agree upon all this consensus critical data like who's paid who or yeah. if there's money that's shared between multiple parties in like a channel to do micropayments and things like that. But your cell phone can't do that. Right. Um, and so most people's laptops could do that, but they'd have to like plug them into a, a wall wart and keep them in the corner of a room all the time, right? And Yeah, so the, the main requirements are addressability and uptime. And what I mean by that is that typically speaking, your laptop, your desktop in the average person's home uh, is you can't plug in a domain into a URL bar or you know an IP address or something and like get into that device. It takes generally a little bit of extra setup, and usually you actually have to get a dedicated uh, resource from your ISP in order to be able to do so. Um, so that was one of the problems: is that if you wanted to be able to receive messages, receive money, even the way that the Lightning Network works, is that you are paying what essentially amounts to a host on the internet as opposed to an address, which is just uh, cryptographic key material. Uh, so if you're paying a host on the internet, you have to be able to reach it. You have to be able to get to it. So that's one of and the And it problems. has to be persistent, like I, yep. IPs change if you're using, um, you know, if you're using normal home router, you don't have static yep. IPs in your home, home appliances. So this box kind of solves a lot of those problems, correct? Yeah, so it solves that, it solves the addressability and it solves the uptime by virtue of just not being something that you take with you, right? So if you could like detach part of your laptop and leave it at home to just do its thing and take the rest of it with you, that like that would have solved it, but you can't. And so we tried to get the minimum viable thing that you could just leave in your home on all the time. So, so uh, a lot of people who are excited about the the sort of the, the, the ideal goal of Bitcoin, which is we should have peer-to-peer -peer money that mm -hmm. doesn't rely on anyone in between me and the person I wanna pay. Uh, this finally actually is, is, is one of a series of devices that you know, there have been from other people, personal server-like devices that can actually make that true for your average person yep. who, who so, was otherwise just using Coinbase uh, and trusting Coinbase's servers to access the Bitcoin protocol on their behalf now they can access it directly, right? Yep. So the, there's actually a third um, component to you know what is necessary for the software to run, and that is the ability to install it and manage it. 
install, configure, and manage on an ongoing but basis. Surely that's and, easy. I've installed programs on my Mac before, and it wasn't so bad. You just drag it. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know the the origin story of Start Nine. Now, when we left when we left Salt, we weren't just like let's go build Start Nine. We actually didn't know what we were going to do next. We knew what our principles were, and we knew what we were interested in, mm -hmm. but we didn't actually have a concrete idea for a, a business. And, you know, I was here one day and Keegan and I were, you know, he had already set up a lightning node and we were going to start playing with it. And so I went to go set up a lightning node and, you know, I, you know, I'm a technical guy. I know how to build apps. I can, I, you know, I, I knew that I could do it, but I opened it up and I just, I looked at the screen and I just went, I don't want to do that. This is what I want to do like, with my whole I, I want to do it as an experiment, <laughs> but, but I, I was thinking almost as another person, like, I don't want to do that. My goal is to be running lightning in a self-sovereign proper way, but I don't want necessarily. I feel like, yeah, I feel like right now, if you're, if you're really dedicated to that, you take it on as like this, this semi-insane home hobby project. Yeah, so it's, like, yeah, well, it's I was frustrated with Comcast or Fios or somebody like wanting to rent me a router. And I was like, I could buy my own router. And then I was like, wait a minute, what are these things? They're just computers with crappy Stand internal up. hardware. They're like super yeah. slow. They don't have much RAM. They can't do encryption operations quickly if I wanted to use a VPN or something like that. I'll probably just build one. So I like looked into PFSense, the um, home open source router software that's built on FreeBSD. And I started doing it and I was like, oh God, what have I done? <laughs> I've now got this like bespoke mini PC in the corner of my kitchen that is my router. And, and long story short, it turned out fine. Like after probably like a couple weekends of dedicated, like I'm technical, but not super technical, uh, YouTubing and, uh, and, and Googling of how to set this thing up, I got it working. And now it's 10 times better than any router out there. I've done some personal due diligence auditing, you know, how it's set up and it can do things like encrypt that my crappy router from Fios can't. But it's like this insane hobbyist quest of mine. And when I tell people like, this is fun, you should try it. They're like, yeah, maybe, I don't know. That's a lot of work for not too much payoff. The hobbyist stuff isn't going to go away. People who want to do it, of course. Do it. But you know, what about the rest? Right. Um, You're, what you were saying is, look, I just wanted to run a lightning node. I'm not ready to take on a whole hobby right now. Yeah. I should be able to just do that. Well, I was, but we were looking for a business opportunity as well. So <laughs> I saw this as a problem, and we weren't alone, right? At this time, Casa was already shipping nodes that came. That's right. You know, with Bitcoin and Lightning. I have and heard so, the Casa guys give that similar pitch that like we need the Steve Jobs. Uh, perfect Apple iPhone experience for a home server. Like it should be this, I've, I've thought like it should be this beautiful so, object that lives in my home that's perfectly designed and works well. Yeah, ours will get beautiful in time. I, I think we have plans, wait till you see them. Um, yeah. but, but we- uh, The current version has a nice cypherpunk kind of aesthetic to it, but, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you'll like the next one The next one's one gonna be awesome. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, we, you know, we started talking about it and I was like, why, why can't I just push a button? Okay. Well, Casa and them, they're shipping with Bitcoin and lightning. Yep. Right? They're not, it's not like I have this general purpose server and then I just install whatever, yep. you know, I just install Bitcoin and lightning. Um, so it was a very bespoke product. Okay. And as you were and, saying, there's a whole bunch of other distributed apps yeah. out there. And the world has needs beyond money. Right, like communication, data storage, uh, social networking, you, you IoT name it. stuff. Like I've, I've got That's, a bunch of smart bulbs and they all phone home to China, one, right? Why it's is a big that? big one that is not lost on us at all. Um, <laughs> so we got big plans. But, but like, and so we started talking about like why I couldn't run email or uh, some sort of peer-to-peer -peer messaging protocol uh, like Matrix or some self-hosted cloud data storage like uh, NextCloud. And the answer was because it's, it, we, nobody's done it. There was no other answer than that. And that there wasn't this apparent demand in the marketplace for it, but that demand is growing at exactly the time when we are doing what we're doing. Like the negative space is starting to become. Yeah. We're suddenly <laughs> realizing that um, maybe I don't want all of my data to be yeah. you know, um, seized without a warrant. Maybe I'd like the warrant requirement, but then it has to be in my house, right? <laughs> so we set out, we started brainstorming about how we could make it such that not only could a user run Bitcoin and Lightning, in the CASA manner, but anything. And it turns out to be a very hard problem. What we are doing is very difficult. In fact, we are at the edge 
of computer science and uh, software technologies in multiple categories. Um, well, so you've already made huge progress um, for folks listening who want one of these things and don't have it yet. Um, Matt and Keegan were generous enough to send Coin Center one. And it was, um, it was probably like January, February. It was right before COVID happened. And so that's why we're kind of now coming back to this now. Uh, it's funny, you guys have this, this self-hosted messaging app called Cups, right? Yep. It's end-to-end -end encrypted. And unlike Signal or any of the other competitors out there for end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, there's no server in the middle relaying the encrypted messages because it's going through your embassy device to the embassy device of the person you're, you're sending these messages to. And then that's the, that's the infrastructure in the middle. So you announced like a new UI for the mobile app that talks to the, the embassy. And it was, I think about a month ago, is that right? Yeah, a few weeks, yeah. yeah. It was a few weeks ago. And I thought, oh cool, I wanna play with this but I left the embassy plugged in in Coin Center's offices downtown and we haven't been going in because of quarantine. And so as a tribute to you guys, the thing worked. I opened up the embassy app on my phone. I was completely remote from the embassy device. I was able to update the Cups Messenger Alpha version that was on there to the newest version that was compatible with your new UI, uh, all remotely from my cell phone in like a one-click experience. And then I was able to use your new messaging app that you guys have published on, on the sort of app store for the embassy device. Yeah. And then I was able to message Keegan using this. It actually UI. gets even a little better than that, which is that the UI that we launched, right? The cups app that you can go download from the app store and put onto your device in order to use cups doesn't actually contain the cups UI. The Cups UI, the interface that you're using to send and receive messages, is actually being served up by Cups server on your embassy. Oh, wow. So it, this is just it's like actually your own private internet. It's your own web page. Well, and, and what you'll notice, <laughs> and, and you'll, one of the things that you can do to notice this is that anytime you update to a new version of it, you'll notice it takes a little longer to load, but mm -hmm. every subsequent time it doesn't. Cached. And so that's because the entire UI is then cached on your phone after the fact. And the reason that we can get away with this, which the normal web cannot, is that we can make the guarantee that unless you've actually updated the embassy app package on, on the embassy itself, uh, the UI can't change. So unlike the web where you're like, well, you have to go to, what is Google going to serve you today? What is Facebook gonna serve you today as far as UIs? Yeah, they can change it completely overnight. Yeah. They can change it completely overnight. Uh, you might not even like the new one, right? Uh, and so this one, it's like, once you download and install it, it's going to work that way in perpetuity. Right, because right? you have control and over the, the correct. thing. So and for people who are watching us on YouTube, this is the, the latest Cups Messenger. As you can see, Keegan's the only person I'm, I'm talking with. We, we can talk about network effects for messaging apps later. Yeah. What you guys just said is amazing. This is not, the, the content here is not coming from my phone. It's nope. coming from this Raspberry Pi that's hopefully well secured in the Coin Center offices right now, um, like two miles away, and that I haven't even seen in the last six months because of coronavirus. And yet it's serving up content that I need on my phone in a secure way. And what's, what's great about that approach is that one, it solves a lot of compatibility issues for us so that you don't have like clients that need to talk to an API of a different version, right? The, the client and the service are sort of served together. So they're always compatible. Uh, and two, it's, it's highly resilient, uh, meaning that you could actually use cups. So if you were to go to the Tor browser right now, just any Tor browser, and plug in the dot on your cups dot onion URL and log in, you would get the exact same interface. So, so even if Apple's just like, we don't like cups, you're not allowed to do this, and they rip it off the app store, there's you another way are in. not out. You just go use a browser. So that, that brings me to another thing I want to bring up. Um, so you mentioned dot onion addresses. All of this stuff between the end user device and the embassy, which the user might have in their ho house or somewhere else is happening over Tor. Yeah, Correct. Right? Yep. So why, why choose Tor and did that make things difficult for you or? So Tor, it solves two, 
Tor was the main purpose of Tor. I, actually, I don't even want to say it's main purpose. It has many really convenient, like, it was a convenient conjunction of purposes. But one of the things that it solved was the addressability problem. Um, the way that Tor works when you access a hidden service, which is one of those things with a dot onion at the end, uh, is that it actually has two outbound TCP connections, which means that you never actually are, in, in, unlike the way that the internet works, you don't have to dial a static IP. This onion address contains all of the information to essentially establish a connection end to end with the server, no matter how many firewalls it's behind, right? It can be behind 10 firewalls. And so long as uh, Tor traffic itself is not being uh, blocked, right? Uh, you can basically go through as many layers of indirection as you want. So if you're like in an apartment building, uh, even like a lot of people might have a, an ISP set up in a large apartment building where, like, where they can't really get even dedicated mm -hmm. IP addresses, this would solve that. Um, and so it allowed us to be able to, to dial these things uh, from, from anywhere in the world. It, and in addition to that, it allowed every different service to be hosted on a different one so that it, they were uncorrelated. So uh, you could be running Bitcoin on a hidden service. You can be running cups on a hidden service from the same device. And there is no one on earth who would be able to tell that they're even on the same device. That's it. It allowed my phone to talk to my embassy and my embassy to talk to your embassy without asking anyone to make that connection. We didn't need to go set up an IP address. We didn't need to configure your router for port forwarding. It's that right. we, these, each of these devices forwarding. exist sort of in this. Port forwarding is my loud. least favorite thing. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't need it with Tor. So the addressability problem is just solved by Tor. That's cool. And then, oh, by the way, we get anonymity of communications at the same time. And, and I was going to say, like, my initial thought was like, oh, yeah, they're using Tor for the privacy because it's, it's encrypted you know, data instead of just naked data over the internet. And it's, you, you don't know who it's coming from because it's going through this onion routing process where every time it hops a node, it gets another little like, yeah. There's actually, there's actually even one more feature that it solves for us that uh, we, we would have had to solve in a very gross way otherwise, which is that, you know how when you visit any website, there's the green lock that represents SSL that says yeah. like basically your communication is private from end to end. Probably. Uh, the, if, if the certificate well, authority isn't screwed it, up. <laughs> it's private with respect to interlocutors, yeah. right? It's not necessarily, if the, the end point is compromised, yeah, then, then you're screwed. Still, yeah, yeah uh, not secure. But the idea is, is that the reason that any of that works is if there is, you know, we call it the CA cabal around here, but like there's a group of, what are called certificate authorities that basically bootstrap the trust for the entire internet. And uh, in order for a person to be able to set up one of these services in an encrypted way using the standard SSL stuff, they would need to either go through the, the uh, CA cabal or they would need to sort of mock it out in a less than ideal uh, setup process. Uh, we still have some ideas about how we might want to solve uh, that, but what Tor gives us is end-to-end -end encryption without having to ask for permission, mm -hmm. right? You know for a fact that the person that you're talking to on the other end of this connection is who they say they are because the Onion address itself is uh, intrinsically linked to the encryption keys that are used to actually uh, do that communication. Now there seem to me to be a couple like limitations of this aspect of the architecture though like most people don't run tor uh, a tor browser on their desktop and until i started playing with you guys stuff i didn't even know android or ios did tor effectively have you guys actually like built some of the infrastructure to make that possible oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> well so the Probably the largest project that we just got finished doing, actually no, CUPS is probably the most recent major project, but right up leading to CUPS, there was a major feature that we had released, which is being able to talk to your embassy remotely over Tor. We had to build out all of the, uh, we had to build out a lot of the mobile infrastructure to be able to do that. Don't get me wrong, there, is, there exists already iOS and Android Tor libraries, but they're actually extremely 
um, young in their yeah. implementations. They're actually just ports of the sub module within the Tor browser, sort of really naively ported to those devices. And so we had to build out some of the infrastructure to get those glued into a standard iOS and Android app uh, in order to be able to do that. And, and so we did that first in the embassy app and then we ported it to Cubs. Right, so, so that's what allowed me to, in a very secure way, update my embassy remotely from my house yeah, without yeah. ever going to the coin center office. Yeah. So that, that was like the first thing I had to build and it and, worked. And you didn't have to set up Tor. Right, you didn't even no. if you didn't show an onion icon in your app, you wouldn't even know that you were using Tor. So that's, that's right. what we're doing is we are obfuscating uh, this essential and central part part of our uh, infrastructure, such that the end user doesn't need to know anything about Tor or how it works or how to set it up. We that's what we're doing is we're making it easy, but we're not compromising. Right. So, the, so this was the point you were making earlier, wherein. Your average user is going to hopefully have an app that they download from the Play Store or the iOS Store that doesn't even have an Onion logo on it, doesn't say anything about Onion addresses. It yeah. just opens and it looks like a chat app. But if the Apple uh, uh, App Store was to block you guys mm -hmm. for some reason, you could still just use that same functionality using a Tor browser. But the Tor browser is just like a fallback. Ideally, because yeah. those things are frightening and confusing to people. You should just have yeah. it. Clean. They're getting better. And, and not only that, but there's nothing that prevents more uh, curated and you know, bespoke Tor browsers from emerging. Hint, hint. I remember like playing around with Tor years ago and it just seemed absurdly slow. And Well, so, so Tor has latency for sure. Um, you know, it, at the end of the day, if every piece of communication between every server, every embassy on earth and all the phones connecting to it is done over Tor indefinitely, it's going to be a less quality experience than what we have today. It's not going to be as snappy. Uh, we also know how to solve that. Uh, oh, really? Tough, yeah, well, it's a tough problem and we won't get into the weeds right now, but we have ways of solving the latency issue with Tor. Well, there's also the throughput issue too, right? which is I think what you're talking about. Like if you tried to stream a video over Tor a few years ago, uh, it was basically impossible. Um, now it's actually not so bad. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with just the, the amount of bandwidth that the Tor network is serving is going up. And, you know, we have plans to actually, you know, as more embassies get sold, we're going to be putting more stress on the Tor network, right? Mm -hmm but there's actually no reason that your embassy can't get self-contribute bandwidth back to the Tor network. I was gonna ask, so is, is, is the embassy that I'm running in Coin Center office uh, also a, a fully functioning relay node or? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We actually uh, run, we, we run a relay node in the Coin Center office. It was like one of a few things we were determined to actually get working to contribute to public goods on the internet. But what's the roadmap then? Like, does it need to be more powerful hardware or? It, it's just, it needs to be a prioritized feature. Um, we have a lot on the roadmap in, in coming up. Because, uh, you know, the, right now we've sort of been talking about it from an, an app, uh, sort of a user perspective, but we have the entire other side that we have to build out too, which is uh, making it easy for developers to get their applications ported onto the embassy. Right. right? To this day, all of the applications that, you, that are available on the embassy uh, you know, we put on, on there. Right. But at some point we want to be able to get to a point where developers can in a self-serve manner be able to build out their software, package it up in a way and then submit it uh, so that it can be listed on, on our store or even be able to host it on sort of an independent store uh, if they wanted to. And so a lot, of, a lot of what we're working on is that as well as the core infrastructure to be able to do more complicated app setups. What about names? So the other thing that, that strikes me as still difficult is with, the, with the Cups app is in order to you know, get someone to chat with me, I share this really long dot onion address, which is for people who have never used Tor, it's just it's a long like garbled line of text. It's like a half. Um, yeah, so decentralized we, DNS is tough. Yeah. Um, you know, our approach right now. So just, just for people who aren't super technical, that's, that's matching a, name, a human readable name to some sort of address. Address, yeah. So could yeah. we match Matt to x1579.onion, et cetera? Yeah. yeah. 
And in theory, it's possible to do it in a trustless way. Um, there are companies working on that. There are projects out there. Um, it's, it's coming and we will leverage it as it becomes available and we may contribute to that development as well. Um, but we actually don't consider it to be uh, a huge problem right now. Um, so our general approach to the user experience of the embassy and all of its apps and future apps is that our hypothesis is that the user will tolerate a small degree of initial setup as long as it's straightforward, right? As long as it's easy, that they will tolerate the effort. In fact, we actually, we, I like to think of this almost as a, as a feature, right? That if you do it yourself, if there's some degree of effort required, there's a reward system built into like that. Like you like gardening, that, you don't just like looking at the yeah. power. It's the, yeah, it's, the it's almost like setting up an Ikea piece of furniture. Right? Like, <laughs> as long as the instructions. Everyone feels awesome about themselves when they follow right. the really straightforward directions to build this piece of furniture. And, and it's, it's in a way, it's almost better yeah. than, than just buying it. Uh, I like that. So you, you guys don't necessarily need to make this thing um, completely one-click solution. <laughs> it just yeah. needs to be not cloning a GitHub repository uh, yes. and, and then like unpacking it and building and building your own client yeah. scratch and all the things. Correct. that So we think there's something actually really powerful in yep. this idea that like, all right, you want to message with somebody totally privately. You got to share this like weird looking thing with them on some side channel and then you do it and you're like, oh, that wasn't that hard, but like I did it. Yeah. And it, it feels even more sovereign. And, and not only that, but it's, kind of necessary too because if, if we did truly make it one click it means we're somewhere in the middle man that's right for you which yeah. is not good yeah. yeah but even still like there are other there are other things in this space that people have already become accustomed to with their very long uh, uh sequences of characters notably addresses within cryptocurrencies and you know the same solutions that have been used there right uh like qr codes uh QR can codes. be applied yeah. here too Right. I like the little icons that create a unique representation of your address. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's a neat, neat little feature. I yeah. do though, like have huge anxiety about sending a Bitcoin transaction if I'm doing it myself and not over Coinbase yeah. or something like that. Like yeah. even if it's a modest amount of money, it's like, oh, there's so many letters that could flip one digit and then. <laughs> well, so if, if this makes you feel any better, uh, there is a one in 4 billion chance that I, typo in your in an address will result in a valid address so the wallet won't process it so the wallet just won't process it oh i never knew that that's yeah they're yeah. hashes are just like black <laughs> magic like that's insane <laughs> yeah. that cool. not only would it be astronomically impossible for me to accidentally come up with someone else's private key or generate the same you know public private key pair as someone else but even generating one that's valid is yeah that's correct yeah, there's a four byte checksum at the end of uh, the uh, um, address, and four bytes is roughly four billion in terms of like the number of numbers you can represent in there. And so, if it doesn't match the rest of the address perfectly, then it just won't process. Sometimes I think we should have like a, a book of like strange metaphysical facts about math that's important to cryptography and computer science. Like, because yeah. it needs to be, it's hard to explain to, cool. to, to lay people like, like myself. Like I, as a lawyer, I had to like get up to speed on this in order to be able to talk about it in an in a informed way to policymakers. The metaphor that, that always worked for me was, uh, I think it's, you guys could probably correct me if I'm, I'm a little off. If you shuffle a deck of cards well, um, someone else could shuffle a deck of cards for the rest of the like the rest of their life or maybe even like till the heat death of the universe and it's unlikely they'd come up with the exact same order of those cards in the deck oh you want a fact like that yeah. so people often talk about like well what if the encryption is broken right so if you took all if you built a dyson sphere around the sun right <laughs> and i think i could come all, up with more energy than that come on man <laughs> and, and, and captured all of its energy for uh 30 years right uh attainable you, you would be able to make a computer count up to i think two to the 192 uh key, encryption keys are using two to the 256 yeah and that is an idea, if you powered an ideal computer, which is operating somewhere near zero Kelvin, 
uh, and it would only just be able to power this counter all the way up. It wouldn't even have any room left to do any useful computation with those numbers. And so it's not like we are that there's some discovery that needs to be made in order, like for, for hardware, in order to be able to make faster computers. It's like, it's like until your computer occupies something other than space, uh, and oh. that your computation is like taking no time that like you can't actually break this stuff. that's wild it's like so even with like godlike command of resources in meat space there's things in cyberspace that you can't do that's nuts yeah and that might be a, a good place to start rounding it up because you guys don't have godlike command of meat space but like you guys have built something that is 10 times more user friendly to actually allow me to have physical infrastructure to run a Bitcoin node, um, soon to run a Lightning node. Uh, you guys also have a password manager. Do you want yep. to talk about that briefly? Because I think that's important. So, yeah, it's Bitwarden. Bitwarden is an open source password manager. So we are not in the application development business. We built Cups as a sandbox experiment to test our own application uh, sort of submission process because we want other developers to be able to do this. But um, we're building the platform for these applications, not the applications themselves. So Bitwarden uh, is already in existence. It's a fantastic software. It's a great team. They're moving very quickly. And it works just like LastPass, basically, right? Which most more people are familiar with. Uh, except that Bitwarden can be totally self-hosted. Um, and so that's not easy I'm, to do. Yeah. If I'm generating um, hundreds of passwords for all of the centralized web servers that I log into every day, like Facebook or Gmail or whatever, I don't have to store those with a company. Right, you yeah. store them yourself. They're actually stored physically on the embassy, uh, which today is a little bit of a risk because if, you're, you know, if your embassy dies, you, know, you start smashing it with a hammer, or you have you know, a fire or something It like is that. in our you coin center it. office with, <laughs> with Naraj in your, charge of it. And we your passwords are gone then. Right? Like <laughs> He's if, gonna if, drop an umbrella in front of the door and we'll never be able to get access to it again. <laughs> and, and we're aware of this as being an essential uh, problem and, and prohibition to our own product offering growing indefinitely. Um, and so we are focusing actually on uh, backup storage solutions, cloud storage solutions that do not involve third party trust. Well, your operating system is called Mesh OS, right? No. It, we rebranded it. Oh, you rebranded? Um, Darn it. The earliest, the earliest versions of it, yeah, we were calling Mesh OS. But I think I just purged the last reference to Mesh OS out of the code. Like, oh, yeah, brought it back ago. from the dead. It's but, Ambassador. Ambassador, okay. But an ambassador the, lives in an embassy, right? The image I got from that when we first talked was that I could have several of these, right? And they could yep. work together? Yep. Yeah. So, so, so if in a future evolution, the product was cheap and people who really cared about their privacy and security and autonomy wanted to have a robust personal store of passwords, it could be across what? Like three yeah, affordable and, devices, right? And, and not, affordable devices. Not, not only that, but you actually don't, they don't need to be yours, right? Okay, that's we, we have plans for distributed data storage that allow you to store your encrypted passwords on other people's, like your family members. Embassy. So I'd like identify like five friends and be like, together we are um, yeah. secure. They don't see my stuff though. They're just contributing to encrypted no, storage. Yeah, of course not. It's just, it's just a redundancy thing to make sure that if somebody goes down, you don't all go down. In fact, you're all fine. I've thought about this too. Like you were, you, uh, I love what you said about um, the process should be kind of like a game, like a, like, a, like you feel like you're doing something for your own benefit, like you're gardening instead of just looking at someone else's flowers. I love the idea of like one day there being a social experience it's like this because yeah. millennials are famously antisocial, especially maybe computer oriented type folks. But if there was like a, get out there and work with your five closest friends to personally secure each other. That mm -hmm. sounds like a, a fun thing. I don't know. I yeah, would love that. Good. Yep. And, and that's, that's a, on our roadmap. We'll, we'll say, I mean, our roadmap is, is ridiculous. It sounds, uh, but it actually, sounds like a Dyson actually, spear around the sun. <laughs> we have a plan. We're not trying to do this all at once. There's a trajectory. Yeah. Um, but all roads lead to self sovereignty. Um, you know, you had mentioned multiple embassies, what about your, what about your other home devices? What about your camera? What about your doorbell? What about your thermostat? Right? I mean, do you want, does, does, does the temperature of your home need to be stored on a Google server? We don't think so. Um, there's no reason at all 
that these that, devices should not all be interconnected into a so, hive. So can you give me a peek into like what your view next gen hardware is? Will it, will it have, so I've done a little smart home stuff. I've got like mostly Zigbee protocol devices. Will it have like little sticks for Zigbee or Z-Wave or some of the other like smart connected devices stuff? So we are, as I, as I mentioned, our roadmap is extensive when the trajectory is there. We are not doing the smart home IoT personal servants of robots yet. So a lot of that is still being worked out. Um, but, but yes, the, the, there's going to be uh, the embassy that we're selling now is a prototype. And, and to incentivize you know, purchases of it, we added it as an inaugural edition, sort of you know, numbered. Um, because it's an unknown technology, people are taking a risk, and maybe they'll be worth something someday. So you have a numbered one. You're I know. If, if, it, if it was right here, I'd tell you what my number is. But it's pretty low. It's pretty low. Um, and so from the prototype, we are going to introduce a bridge product uh, in the coming weeks that is essentially the same guts as the prototype, um, but with less moving parts. There's no fan. Uh, which is great because the fan is was the weakest part of the hardware itself. Sense. So you can just do like solid state cooling. You just put like yeah. fins on it or something. Yeah. Uh, so different form factor. It's a little sleeker. Um, no fan, and you know, and that and that's it. So anyone with a prototype is going to be just fine. Uh, it's basically going to be the same thing as this one. We're just sort of like cleaning it up a little bit. That's awesome. Um, but the the Embassy Two uh, will be 2021 story. Um, we are in design and, and, you know, conceptualization and even a little bit of uh, tinkering right now with it, but that device will be significantly beefier, uh, from a storage perspective, a processing perspective and a capabilities perspective a, in hardware. Um, so I don't want to leak too much about it because we're really excited to kind of like do this in our own, uh, rollout way, but, um, it's going to be, you know, we will have two products. We will have the lower end product forever so that anyone who wants to, you know, participate and, and access this can do so. We're not going to price anybody out. We are always going to be at the bottom of the market for our standard product. And it's going to serve, it's going to do a lot more than what the price tag suggests as the current one does. Um, and then we're going to come out with the, the, the power embassy, right? The, uh, the beefy guy. And that's beautiful going to object that everything you can imagine. And it's going to have a healthy price tag on. It. That's awesome. I, you, you'll have at least one, one purchaser lined up for that. I can say that. Cool. Uh, uh, I bought yeah, some I bought some absurdly cheap uh, smart bulbs uh, five years ago and um, the company that sold them just went out of business and shut down their servers. And the oh. default behavior on the bulb isn't to respond to electrical circuits. It's to look for the server and until it finds the server to keep flashing. So one day I woke up and all my lights would do if I turned the light switch on was flash. It was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> what, so that's like, that, that, that functionality yeah, should live a great, on a device in my home. <laughs> what a great like tangible example of what we're doing. Yeah. Of what we're not doing, I should say. Like the fact that a light bulb depends on some third party company to turn on is insane. It's amazing. <laughs> Uh, who, oh man, we need to move past that world. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th th that's really what it comes down to is that we are living in a world where technology is increasingly becoming very important to normal function. And when it was not, it was not a huge deal that it was, uh, it could be cut off or administrated by someone else and change the rules because it wasn't a central part of your life. Mm -hmm. But now it is. Traffic and we now have to like, sort of come to terms with that reality and say, well, okay, if that's true, then the architecture that we've all settled for up until this point is just, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna allow society to like exist in a smooth and harmonious way yep. uh, when the, the power imbalance is so, uh, so drastic. Oh, that's right. Yeah, like relying on, the diner's card to make a couple of transactions a year is fine, but when cash disappears and your only choice for transacting is through some bank somewhere, we're fragile. Well, well there is some, some danger uh, associated with, you know, kind of remote companies and organizations managing devices in your home and managing access to your information and your money. Um, that's actually less about the, danger in the sense of an attack. 
like the idea that like these things are malicious and want to like shut you down is actually far lower on the spectrum than the uh, sort of inherent incompetence that comes along with scale of right. large organizations, right? It's not that Google is like this evil entity that wants to attack me. It's that I don't trust that, that one day when my lights go out, my right. Google powered light bulbs, that I'm going to be able to push a button, get a representative on the phone and be like, my light bulbs are out and some guy shows up at my house and immediately fixes it, right? right? My experience with customer service with large companies is that if you get on a three week waiting list and then you do that da, and if they're not evil, they're just, they just can't move as quickly. As, they can't respond in real time. They don't scale. And the initial so problem is move it back to the individual. You have to be able to fix your own light bulb. Yeah. And the initial problems aren't usually malicious either. Like with the Amazon uh, AWS outage, it was like a fat finger error. It was like some poor yeah. soul in and deep. The internet went down. Yeah, like <laughs> press the wrong key and a bunch of hosted yeah. websites don't work. That's terrifying, um, especially it if it's like software in a plane or software in a car. Or yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's time to move the power back to the edges. Um, not because the central has necessarily become evil, even though there is some obviously you know corrupt aspects of many centralized large systems but it's mostly just for for practicality sake like it just doesn't scale yeah you it have to do, you have to put people back in charge of the the things it, that they interact with well that's a perfect way to close it out we have to put people back in charge of the things that they interact with is definitely something i think we can all get behind so thanks guys um this was a great first podcast i'm super happy yeah thanks peter nice job uh Congrats and on the new show and yeah Anytime we'll be um, publishing a backgrounder on our website with like just the facts that you could explain to a non-technical person about the, the start nine um, sort of suite of hardware and software. And uh, I hope you guys have all the success in the world because what you're building is righteous. Cool, man. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Take care guys. Yeah. You too. Bye.